God bless you, RCC family. Welcome to our small group ministry. Today, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 2, verse 14 through 41. I've entitled this lesson, What Does This Mean? Lord, we thank you for this day. We ask that you would open up the scriptures to our hearts, that you would uh, speak to us, and that, Lord, we would draw closer to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Well, the promise of the Holy Spirit has finally come. Now, Peter is going to address the events that have taken place. The disciples are enjoying the visitation of the Spirit. Others are very skeptical about the event. The consensus of opinions range from disbelief to drunkenness that ultimately raises the question for Peter, what does this mean? Peter begins with an explanation concerning the outpouring of the Holy Spirit followed by the meaning of the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, and ends with the exhortation of repentance and baptism. Peter delivers one of the best sermons in the entire New Testament. The outline and content should be something looked at closely for all those aspiring to teach and preach the Word of God. Verses 14 through 21, point one, what does this mean? But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved." This portion of scripture begins with Peter standing up and declaring with a new sense of boldness and conviction, raising his voice, he begins to describe what actually happened. Peter's sermon is regarded as being the work of man filled with the Spirit. He addressed the crowd, which include Jews as well as uh, visitors. Please note that Peter refers several times to the Old Testament prophets within chapters 1 and chapter 2. And what does that mean? It means that he had a good understanding of the Old Testament. It says in verse 15, for these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour, 9 o'clock. The fast didn't end to 10 o'clock. So Peter's first goal is to correct a misunderstanding concerning the audience's interpretation of what took place. He immediately dismisses the lame idea that these men were drunk. It was only 9 o'clock in the morning. Being drunk was not a possibility. Peter will will not take for granted the ignorance of his listeners concerning their basic understanding. But I find something interesting here. How could it be that some people attributed the work of the Holy Spirit to Satan? This shouldn't surprise us. Spiritual discernment can only come from those who are walking in the authority of Christ. Peter refers his audience to the Old Testament prophet Joel, Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And all I'd like to bring to your attention there is what Joel begins with. It says, and it shall come to pass afterwards. Notice the language that Peter uses. He says, in the last days. I think we need to make that connection. The afterwards that Joel is speaking about is directed at the last days. Peter changes the words afterwards to last days, and the last days begin with the promise of a great outpouring of the Spirit. This is significant because the outpouring of the Spirit is a sign that the new covenant is the the continuation of God's redemptive plan for his people, the Jews, as well as the Gentiles. God will take the written law placed on stone tablets and write them on the hearts of his people through the forgiveness of their sins. Notice the language in Joel and also that uh, uh, Peter uses. He uses a lot of uh, language concerning the last days. If you look at uh, verses 18 of the text, or actually 19, and I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire, vapor, smoke, sun shall be turned to darkness and moon to blood before the day 
of the Lord comes. It's reminiscent of language that you'll find in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and also in Luke. But let's look at Mark 13, 24 through 26. It says, but in those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. The imagery of the sun darkened and the moon not giving light is often used in describing God's judgment on a fallen creation. In those days is common Old Testament expression having to do with the Messianic age, the time of Israel's final redemption. And so we're in the last days and we're getting set to see a great return of the Lord from the Jewish people, but they have not yet come. But listen, this day is prophesied in advance. The Messianic age has begun. I'd like you to consider Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23, speaking futuristically of God saving the Jewish people. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days ten men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Peter says that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This requires faith and a response, not just words. Everyone includes both Jews and Gentiles, which brings us to our second point, verses 22 through 36, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men, and God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. And here he's, uh, Peter is going to basically quote from Psalm 16, verse 8 through 11. And in this uh, portion of scripture, the mighty signs done by Jesus was an indication that he was not only claiming to be Messiah, but that he was Messiah. His authority over all creation. While Jesus subjected himself to the human body and suffered, he never ceased being God. God's plan revealed through the prophets was that Jesus would suffer and die from the hands of wicked men. The crucifixion took place as the plan of God. Here we have the paradox of predestination and free will. Putting Jesus to death was simply fulfilling what God had already determined what must be take place. And for your reference, you can look at Ephesians 1, 19 through 20. As I stated, uh, Peter is quoting from Psalm 16, 8 through 11, a psalm that David wrote. He's talking about the right hand uh, uh, of God, and that right hand, of course, is representing the authority and power, the sustainer of life and protector. And then he goes on in that psalm, if you look at, uh, well, actually verses 8 through 11, but even the text that Peter's speaking about, it says, Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will draw on hope, for you have not abandoned my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption, could not be speaking about David, because we know David died and was buried, and uh, his uh, tomb is is still uh, there today. This was in reference to the Messiah and his resurrection. You have made known to me the paths of life. Jesus references this as the narrow road. Peter addresses the crowd, again, with boldness, Verse 29, brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne. He foreknew and spoke about the resurrection of Christ that was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus raised up and of that we are all eyewitnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, 
He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstools. And then he closes down with this verse, verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. David's authorship of the psalm that we looked at in Psalm 16 was common ground between Peter and his Jewish listeners. Peter argues that the psalmist could not be speaking about himself because he died, and David died and was buried, and to the Jews, this was seen as corruption. That's why Christ's body was in the grave for three days and rose again. There was no corruption in Christ. The proof of David's burial was all visible to all. David was speaking prophetically. He knew that one of his descendants would sit on the throne. Verse 33 of that text says, or the meaning would be, having established Jesus as Messiah, he must be raised from the dead. Peter can now go on to uh, give the explanation of the outpouring of the Spirit. So the resurrection of Jesus is understood as the exaltation of Jesus. Now Jesus' presence is expressed through the person of the Holy Spirit. I will pour out my flesh upon all people. And that brings us to point three, verses 37 through 41. And that speaks about repentance and baptism. It says, now, when they heard this, they were cut to heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exalt them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received the word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. When they heard this, the scripture says they were cut to heart. What should we do? Cut to heart because they agreed with the leaders to put Jesus to death. Peter's revelation of Jesus to them was a great surprise considering he was Jewish. He was a fellow Jew who came to the saving knowledge about Jesus Christ. Notice the importance of repentance. Repentance was an important message in the preaching of both John the Baptist, Jesus, the apostles, and the church. Mark 1, 14 and 15 says this, Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of hand of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repentance was also important as Jesus shared his final thoughts before his ascension. In Luke chapter 24, verses 45 through 48, It says the following, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I'm sending the promise of the Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. There's no doubt within anybody's mind that reads the gospel message, that there is a call to repentance, and repentance is necessary for a true conversion. I would like you to consider the following verses in your study. Uh, Acts 3.19, Acts 8.22, Acts 17.30, Acts 20.21, Acts 26-20. Repentance is an essential part of conversion and responding to the gospel. Calvin once said, or insisted, that repentance not only follows faith, but is produced by it. Repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. Also for your consideration would be Acts 5.31, Acts 10.43, Acts 13.38, Acts 26 and 18. Now we're going to be talking a little bit more about the baptism here. What baptism is this referring to? Is this water baptism? Is this spirit baptism? I'll go into that a little bit more as we uh, work through the sermon together. Repentance and baptism become the evidence of conversion. And so as we consider this lesson together, uh, and as you go into your small groups, 
going to ask that you stick really to these three points and work through them together. And let's work on the back end, maybe in a discussion question, to figure out what does it mean to be a part of the body of Christ? What does it mean to be assimilated into the body of Christ? And uh, as we work through this, I believe that we'll have some healthy discussions. And let's ask the Holy Spirit to guide our conversations. So God bless you, and uh, may you continue to study his word. In Jesus' name, amen.